Pat Chantan. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, the, the whole point of this series to, for me in developing this was really to get a chance to talk to people who were illustrating in the um, 70s and 80s mostly and starting mm -hmm. out there. So in a sense, I've, I've kind of broken the mould with you a little bit because you've, I know you've come a little bit later onto that scene. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment too. But um, uh, the fact that you've been so successful you know, it's successful in a way that it's just been, to me, when I look at it, I just think that's unbelievable success and, and, and great. Is the, and, and the fact that that's growing out of, uh, you know, a place like Australia and, and where mm -hmm. you've grown up and lived and worked, to me is, is almost a legacy, perhaps, of, your, of all of that early work, but maybe not. And, and that's maybe something we can talk about as we, we get into this. But mm -hmm. just to sort of introduce you and set the scene, and I'm sure I'm going to miss so many different things, but the ones that are, you know mean a tremendous amount to me when I was looking back over your career, your winner of the Astrid Lindgren Award, I mean, probably the biggest publishing type award for people anywhere on the planet to win that one. And the Annecy Crystal, have I yes. got that right, in 2010? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's an animation award. And I'm yes. told by reliable people here, in, in members of the crew, that that's a very, very prestigious animation yes, award. Yes, I didn't know about it until I won it. And then I was told it was really hard to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was told that too. And of course, the Academy Award um, in 2011 for The Lost Thing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just an extraordinary um, achievement with all of that. So, you know, like it's sort of hard to not to not sort of, it's just walk by you and just think, oh, yeah, Sean Tony Cameron made a big deal. You know, I, I, and he's not part of that group, but yeah. it's just an amazing achievement. So I, I just so happy. Yeah, well, it, it startles me. <laughs> like, it, yeah, it really is. I'm not being, um, it's not false modesty. I, I'm like, I really don't quite understand, Right. you know, why these things have happened like that. All right, and well, they all happened in a little close proximity. Yeah, it did seem to happen proximity. in a little cluster in that, that yeah. 2010, 2000. That's right, yeah, yeah. But we'll get to that in maybe a bit more of a chronological sequence because I'd like mm -hmm. to take you right back, you know, to early days. And mm -hmm. You grew up in Western Australia? Yep. Fremantle, have I got that right? I was born in Fremantle, but right. really just born there. I popped out in Fremantle. Right. And um, grew up in a few suburbs. I think my first, it was the first year or so I was actually in um in North Borneo and Brunei because my father was working right. there as an architect um yeah so my mum had these two young kids out in the jungle somewhere <laughs> sweating it out and pushing snakes out out the door um but I don't remember any of that and um I would have been about one or two years old and then we settled in Hillary's which was at the time a very new newish suburb of um northern part of the um, coastline of Perth, so about 25 kilometres north of the city centre. Right. Um, bushy, windy, sandy kind of place. Already yeah. had quite a nice established neighbourhood yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I guess I lived there um, in a house that my father designed and my father and mother built for, uh, I guess, my next 20 years or so. I wanted to ask you a bit about your, your parents and maybe particularly your father because um, you've, I know you've written a little bit about him here and there and he, he was an immigrant from Penang. Mm -hmm, Malaysia. That's right, yep. yeah. Was it, he was Hokkien, I suppose. Did he, was that yes. his dialect? Yeah. Did he speak that uh, very much in, in the family life? No, or, no. All, all English when he was growing up? Yes. And you had siblings as well? One older brother who's about 18 months older than right. myself. Right. Yeah. And why why did your father come to Australia? What was his Well he came he came to he was originally going to go to Ballarat to study civil engineering, but um for some reason he fell in with a group of um other Asian friends who were studying architecture at what was then WAIT, WA Institute of Technology. Oh, yeah. Or it might have been yeah. called something else even yeah. back then. This was around nineteen sixty. Yeah. And um he, yeah, so he ended up studying architecture and he met my mother at the art store that sold technical yes, pens. I read about that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's interesting because I always thought, oh yeah, she was always working there, but no, she was in the back in the storeroom and then they were short staffed. So for that day, she happened to come out to the counter, which she was very excited about. Like, yeah. you know, I get to be at the counter and yeah. that's um, where my dad came in. And 
I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't think it was necessarily love at first sight, but I think he really needed someone to take to a um, architectural student ball. And so he asked, uh, I think he'd, he'd gone a few times and, as I like to say, I was buying an unnecessary amount of technical yes. pens. <laughs> yeah, I read, I read. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then he asked her out and uh, they got together. And at first she didn't, I don't think she thought much of him, but it was interesting that... Um, and she was 16 at the time, so she was very young. Uh, How old was your father at that time? He was, I think, 26, so right. it was a 10 year age oh, difference. pretty young too, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And I think, I think mentally they're probably about the same age. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, she would like to say that. Um, and uh, yeah, they've, they've been a, they were a really good match for each other, actually, but they really kind of different backgrounds. Um, and obviously... What's your... Was your mother, um, was she born in Australia? Yes. Right. So she's a third generation um, Anglo-Australian. Um, I, would, I think it's half English, half Irish background, which also explains my name. It's all there in my name, like Sean Tan. It's an Irish name with an English spelling yeah, okay. and then a, yeah. a Chinese surname with yeah. a Malaysian yes. twist. So, yes. um, yeah. So it would have been a fairly unusual marriage, really, even at that time. Moment. Yes. Yeah. Did they did they ever talk about that, or were you ever yeah. conscious of that of their of their connection at that time and in that place? Yes and no. Growing up, you know, in any family, it's just like that's your family. Yeah. And um, I I never realised I was Asian until other people mentioned it. You know. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I've heard this expression, I don't know if it's derogatory or not, but a banana, which is like yellow on the outside, white on the inside. I guess yeah. I was a bit like that. Yeah. And um, sometimes, you know, even later when I, I, was, I started working, people were sometimes surprised that I was, when they met me, because most of the time I wasn't meeting the people I worked for. I was talking on the phone yeah. or something, and they're yeah. like, oh, you're, you're yeah. Chinese or yeah. half Chinese. Um, but 1960s Western Australia, not the most necessarily open-minded no, no, place in the world so. and the white Australia policy was still in force. Yep. This really pretty primitive, yeah. <laughs> primitive yeah. Yeah. Um, both in its design and execution. And um, uh, there, was a, uh, there, was a, there was a bit of obviously resistance, um, but my mum was quite rebellious too. Just, oh yeah, I could imagine that actually. Yeah. And so she didn't care. It's not like she, yeah. she, met, she got together with my dad to be yeah, rebellious. Yeah. She just liked him yeah. and she thought, this is a guy, type of guy I've never met before. He's really interesting. He's really nice. Yeah. And um, it never actually occurred to her that he was Chinese. Like she didn't see that yeah. until people started mentioning. And yeah. uh, I know there was an incident, for instance, where the, um, their first wedding cake a bit like with some of the same-sex marriage stuff that's happening now. The first wedding cake um, person, uh, I think, refused to bake a cake because yeah, right. it's an uh, interracial yeah. marriage. Yeah. Um, so that's it's interesting. It's weird, isn't it? These things play themselves out with cake making. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it about the cake? Right. That's where the yeah. social crises really come to a head. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so strange, isn't it? Um, I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't want to talk too much about your parents, but I am intrigued with your father because he would have been an immigrant from mainland China too before he came to Penang. I assume he would have been. He wasn't, but his parents were. His parents were, mm. yeah. And do you know why they left China? Did they, did, is there a story in the family about that? I think I once knew, and I can't recall right. now. Um, economic reasons, yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, I think they were, his family ended up being quite successful. Right. Um, not massively, but they ran their own business, which yeah. was making, well, actually, cakes, <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough, <laughs> um, like festive cakes for yeah. Chinese New Year yeah. and, and also special occasion yeah. cakes and biscuits. Yeah. And um, I should ask him more about it, actually, because it's such a different life to the one... And he's, he's still around, is he still? still yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. I've actually interviewed my parents a few times like this right. um, more recently. Right. Um, just because some relatives have passed away and not that they're going to, but I just thought I should be should doing stuff like that. I, you know, I was sort of intrigued. I mean, I, I, and I know that you're somewhat wary of literal interpretations of your work. And, um, but, I, you know, noticing that long tale of the dragon in the immigrant story, you know, mm -hmm. floating around there, and I was thinking, oh, maybe there's some sort of connection there with the China, mainland China story. And, because during that period when your father would have migrated, 
Mm. That would have been a massive movement in, in that area of you know people moving everywhere in China itself and then mm -hmm. coming out to the diaspora of uh, Penang and Malaysian countries like that. Mm. I said, oh, I wonder if that's sort of there. There are stories in behind all of that, you know, that come. Yeah, down that's to that's that's a good question. Okay. Actually, I don't. Now that you mention it, my my knowledge is a bit vague. I would have asked my father about it quite a bit when I was working on the arrival, actually, because it sort of started. Yes. With um, his story, and by extension, I became curious about the Chinese in Perth. Yep. Have had a really long history there, but they were a very segregated community of often market gardeners. Yep. Yeah. on the um, South Perth foreshore, and, which is now all parkland. So um, that was sort of an interesting starting point. But the, the yeah, I, I hadn't actually thought about that dragon imagery in terms of a, a, a Chinese past, but I'm, I'm always aware with the Chinese stuff, I always get this feeling of a, of a dark, sad past that's very ancient. Um, so it's almost a subconscious intuition. Yes, because, you know, look, I, without knowing any of the details, but uh, so many families were caught up in that tumultuous time of, uh, you know, the nationalists and communists and mm -hmm. all of that movement that was going mm. on at that time. And so much of it is so dark and so sad. Yeah. And I think a lot of those stories are lost, you know, especially for migrants who come to Australia, you know, because they go back and nobody wants to talk too much about sure, them, yeah. all that kind and of stuff. Sure, yeah. political reasons yeah. as yeah. well for not discussing things. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're growing up with your brother, and where did the where did the drawing come from? You know, you must have. I know you've written um, a little bit about drawing, you know, mm -hmm. as a child, and you you've described yourself as a good drawer, which yes. is in quotation. Marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was what other kids always said. Yeah. Oh, you're a good drawer. <laughs> this, this is my friend Sean. He's a good drawer. You know, like that's your thing, um, and and that was important too because. I don't want to make a big deal about the the racial background, but um, and I don't know if it was a big deal because uh, some kids didn't see it, and some kids did. Adults tended to see it more than kids. Um, but I became aware that I was a little bit different, and it wasn't so much race actually; it was stature. I was right. just really tiny, right. so that's one of the things that you often forget about racial differences. Yeah. There's also physique differences, and so yeah. um, Australia's suburban Australia is often very for kids very sporty you yes, know yes. robust kind of place and I was very good at sports but I just didn't look like I was good at them and so I, I tended to be a bit marginalized um, and there were always incidents you know on, on t-ball teams where I wasn't picked for the team and so on you know it's like oh we need to win this match you just <laughs> that sort of thing and it's like I was one of the best players but it's just the reading of it of the coach, I just didn't, the yeah, little Asian yeah. kid's probably not going to do so well. Yeah. So it was kind of important to um, have another talent. And I think all kids, doesn't matter what your background is, you're always looking for an, an edge or something that, yeah. especially when you're at, I see with my own daughter who's now five, that it's really Im important to have this competitive, not competitive, but to have some status, which never used to be an issue before. Yeah. Um, and part of that is, is making friends and that sort of thing. But the basic, um, beyond all that, because one thing I like about drawing is it's not predicated on social reasons. It's what you do when you're not being social, yeah. you know, for your yeah. own entertainment. Yeah. And, um, and I was just naturally good at it. And I suspect that an element of that is genetic because my mother, um, she was never a trained artist um, but she was, she's naturally good at drawing, at that pretty basic skill of just looking at a thing and breaking it down into forms and copying those forms, because that's what it all boils down to. Did she, did she do any professional work, or is this was just something she was doing for no, herself? No, she or? just did it for herself. Yeah. And she, as a teenager, she used to send drawings to um, newspapers, and right. they would be published. Fantastic. Like here, Christine Brown, has, right. who is 14 years old, has right. drawn, and they're amazing looking drawings. But she grew up in a very working class household where um, there was no real understanding of the value of not just artistic practices, but education generally. Yeah. Okay. So it was like, the sooner you can get out and get a job, the better. Don't waste your time on school. So your mentality. your mother's work sort of was aspirational? You, you obviously yes. saw her doing it and thought, oh, that's really cool. And um, I saw a few examples. I remember she painted a Jungle Book mural on my bedroom in one house we were renting, and that was quite 
amazing that she could just draw and looked exactly like the book picture. She copied it from a right, book. Right. So she's always very good at copying things. Yeah. And um, she, I re she, we had a conversation a long time later where she said her dream was to be a Disney animator all through her childhood. Um, and But the problem was that in the culture where she grew up, for a start, she was a female, which, you know, counted against her in terms of yep. study and, and that sort of thing. But secondly, there was just this, this, it wasn't like anything negative. It was just no understanding that art could be a serious job, you know, yep. and a real job. Um, and so it was seen as a clever thing that you could do. That's really clever. You do a great drawing and, and it'd be like a trick. That's really clever, but it's got yep. no spiritual or um, practical extension beyond that, yeah. you know. And probably um, particularly diff difficult too in Western Australia, where you know there wouldn't have been commercial yeah. operations. Even when I found, even I found that when I started illustrating, it's like, what, what the hell do I do? Because <laughs> there's not much industry here. Absolutely. One of the one of the themes I notice with illustrators um, is that very often they've had very unstructured childhoods, you know, in the sense that they've often very, I mean, it's quite really common and I sort of really do think like it's kind of a thing, um, mm. where they are pretty much left to their own devices. Mm -hmm. and That's parents interesting. don't kind of get too involved with their right, lives. Okay. That, that sort of is, it allows them kind of that sense of freedom in their mind to think, oh yeah, I can draw and I can do yeah, this, yeah. I can do this. And as opposed to perhaps the idea that someone was actually guiding them, I mean, was that that yeah, well, it's interesting. So I didn't know that's true of other illustrators, but it's certainly true of me. Yeah, there was no guidance. Um, the guidance took the form of encouragement. So if you like something, um, you know, like a, at one point I remember I was, I just liked the way it looked when people played the piano. So my parents said, "Oh, well, let's let's you know get him on a piano." But I wasn't really that interested. But they were that keen to sort of yeah. pick up on yeah. any interest. My brother. Um, at the age of about six, became obsessed with crystals because a friend gave him a quartz crystal. And so then there was all these, you know, you know, what visits to gem museums and stuff like that. And oh, um, what would you like for Christmas? I'd like a geopic you know, hammer. Right. So I got right. that. And right. um, he's now a geologist and a really successful geologist and um, currently working in Brazil. Um, and for me, I liked drawing there was not much instruction of like, do it like this, do it like that. It was more like, do you like drawing? Here's some paper and pencils, off you go. Yeah. And um, because my father was an architect, well, I had the experience of seeing an adult drawing as a job. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. And that was somewhat yeah. significant. Yeah. And my first actual paid commission was I got to draw a little palm tree on one of his architectural elevations and he gave me 20 cents. <laughs> so I, that's my first freelance illustration job. And, um, Hang on, what year was this? Give us a, a rough year. <laughs> Let's just... Oh, gosh, I don't know. I probably would have been about seven or eight yeah, years okay. old. Yeah. yeah, so that would have been 1981 or okay. 82. Right. I just want to mark that moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First, first paid job. <laughs> yes. I also, um, around the same time, I did another... Now, it would have been a bit later. My first actual proper commission was the, the school canteen ladies asked me to draw a poster for this new burger that they were <laughs> making called a space burger. And so I did a drawing, I must have been about uh, more than, uh, maybe about eight because to be able to draw this, but it was a alien riding a, a burger in space, like a spaceship with a steering wheel, which was all my idea. And they gave me a bag of chips. So that was like my first, um, it was like cheesels. <laughs> My first uh, If only we commission. could find the original. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd love to see it. Um, so, uh, yeah, but to answer your question, um, yeah, my father had all these, um, after the houses were built and everything, and he, you know, they were mostly just residential houses he was drawing, could turn the big piece of paper uh, over yeah, and um, yeah. draw on the back. So it was like really luxurious for a kid to yeah, just be able to draw yeah. dinosaurs and yeah. volcanoes and yeah. stuff. And did you, I mean, you, you, I guess a lot of those experiences were your primary years. As you moved into secondary school, mm -hmm. did you have any sort of aspirational sense that you could make some kind of career from art or drawing or the visual arts in any kind of way? Or was that still just so distant? Well, I had an aspiration, but there was a lot of negative um, 
negative advice about it. Really? What, what kind of negative advice? Well, the school system didn't, clearly didn't, well, it's funny actually, because I went to a, um, a high school, which was a, a special arts school. There were three in Western Australia at the time. Right. And the closest one to me was um, in the suburb of Balcatta, which was some 15 kilometers away. So I had quite a long commute to and from school. Yeah. Um, it did have a special art program, which proved to be quite formative for me, I think, because uh, particularly they had a um, Saturday morning, three hour um, class every Saturday where you'd be taught by practicing artists, not a teacher, practicing right. artists. Right. And we had sculptors, textile um, designers, il an illustrator, I remember once. Um, I wasn't that interested in illustration, interestingly, right. but I liked sculpture and, and we had some crazy artists who were just wild and others who were like really quite anal and, you know, you've got to do it like this. And so it was a real good exposure to a glimpse of artistic practice across a, across a wide, wide range, but also to realise, hey, there's people in the community that actually work as artists. I'd never met any until until high school. I'd never met anyone who made art as a living, like as a job. So, yeah, that's quite unusual, again, with, with uh, what I know about other illustrators. It normally doesn't come together to them until after secondary school. Yeah. You know, that, they, they just try a few things. But... You really were getting quite directed fairly early from that point of view, weren't you? But you said yeah. it was negative, and I'm kind of interested in what way that was Yeah, negative. so the, the special art program at Balcata High School, that was that was good. And the school generally was was pretty pretty good, I think. Uh, I don't have anything negative to right. say right. about it. Um, and it's just a state school, yeah. um, so it was very straightforward. But uh, with the rest of the whole culture of the education system at the time, and I don't know if it's any different now, but art was like a, a really like lesser subject, you know, anything to the arts and humanities were not considered that important. And there was a real emphasis, if you were smart, and I was a pretty smart kid, you should be doing physics, chemistry, and maths. Right. Those were like the big three. Right, yeah. And you're kind of wasting your time on anything else. Right, okay. And so they, I, that, and I was pretty good at those subjects too, and I found them interesting. So I've always been divided between science and humanities. I've liked both, and um, uh, and it could be partly because my brother's very into the sciences, and I always looked up to him and what he was doing. Um, but it was interesting that you know they had these charts that sort of show. Um, you know, careers and yes, they I've were kind of yes, hierarchical yeah. and the art yeah. ones were kind of like not that significant but also within the art and creative practice ones there was nothing there that I thought that that really appeals right. to me yeah. and um, at one point uh, you know uh, getting some career counselling it was like well maybe you could be a illustrator of science books you know like doing okay. die and I thought is that it you know is that what yeah. you do if you're good at drawing yeah um but I was getting a different perspective from the special art and yeah, saying you okay. can do this you can do that but the general <laughs> message was still it's a real hard economic struggle and um you might want to think about having another right. career even a, you know like art can be your something that you do is a hobby that was the line that yep. you often got you could do this in your spare time and I'm not the kind of person who's very um, by nature rebellious or trailblazing or entrepreneurial so I quite like the idea of having a stable job with a stable income and so that always bothered me that you know um, the idea of being an artist what is what is that and I still didn't have much of a sense of what what that was in terms of a lifestyle and career so um, when I finished high school, um, my best subjects were the science subjects. Um, I didn't make the top 10% in art, even though that was really my best subject. I think that's a problem with the assessment system. Um, and uh, I was, my first sort of choice for university study was biotechnology at Curtin University, um, because I had some interest in that. And it was only after thinking carefully about what 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 is really fun to me and i decided well art is painting and drawing and writing that's what i do when i'm not at school like when i had spare time i would paint and draw write science fiction stories 
fitness. And the other thing was that I realized they didn't actually understand that much about art. When I went to the uh, WA Art Gallery, I, I, it bothered me that I didn't understand most of what I was looking at. I thought, I need to study this because I felt I understood science. I kind of get that philosophically. And I've, you know, I've got a grasp of that the art and humanities, I still don't understand um, what people are talking about half the time. So I need to study that. So I went and did an arts degree at UWA. Ah, so what were you what were you studying when you entered into that university course? What were your subjects? Um, it was fine art and English literature and philosophy, which I'd always wanted to do but wasn't available in high school in those days, and history, which I had a I realised by year twelve in high school that I actually liked history and I I realised this this is the one subject that's about all the other subjects right. is history. Yeah. So yeah. um yeah, so I did, uh, and then I eventually, um, it, it sort of ended up doing a double double major with um, fine arts and English literature. So I dropped philosophy. Philosophy ended up being a bit too close to almost maths to me when it got to the <laughs> higher level. It was like, this subject is, well, history was about everything. Yeah. Philosophy is about nothing except philosophy, you know, yeah. and yeah. I found that quite maddening. Um, it was almost like computer programming or something. Yeah, it can be like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it kind of answered all, all the, my basic questions in the first year. And, and uh, uh, the fine arts and English lit, um, I don't know, the whole time I was at university, I felt very uncertain why I was there, to be honest. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it was very academic. Yeah. I thought there'd be more of a practical component, Yeah. Um, but there wasn't. Yeah. And, um, so I just want to get to orientate the year. What, what year would you have started that degree? 1992 okay. to, or, or possibly 91, 91 or 92 up to, I graduated in 95. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, look, I think probably at the time there were probably many people like yourself who've done courses in the liberal arts like that and thought, mm. I don't know quite what I'm doing it for yeah. and, and where it's going to take me or yes. anything like that. I want to pick up on one thing there because I, I didn't know about this about you, that you had an interest in philosophy. Have you kept that kept that going? Not really. Um, I mean, I, yeah, probably not. Um, when people mention philosophers, I, I have a bit of context. Right. Well, the, the reason why I was, uh, again, just preparing myself for the interview and I was just looking through your work and, of course, one of the things you cannot help but be a standard by as well is the volume of work you do. I mean, there's oh, just really? so much. Yes, incredible okay. amount, you know, in, in volume and drawing and all of those things. And, you know, the time it must take you to do to, to literally produce that volume of work mm. it just must be just untold hours. And um, I've very conscious of Nietzsche and his claim for great artists is that they produce a large amount of volume and then through that volume they are stumble upon things that really work mm -hmm. and they, they can find things just by the sheer amount of work they do and then they start mm -hmm. to concentrate on that. Does that, what, does that ring any bell with you or, or resonate with you in any kind of way? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd agree that you need to do a lot because a lot of it's not very good. Right. Um, how, do, how do you determine that, that it's not very good? I mean, when you say sketchy... It, it, you've ha you sort of feels, um, it feels like you've, you've grown in some way by doing it. If the bad okay. work feels, it can, be, it can look good yeah, and everything, yeah. but it can feel repetitive. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and sort of, um, well, I love this quote from Picasso, um, He's not my favourite artist, but he's very quotable. Um, <laughs> um, when he, he was asked what he thought about fake Picassos, and he said, um, you know, I don't like them because many of them are done by me. Right. And, uh, and that's what happens too when you're doing too much yes. art is you yes. actually start imitating yourself, yes. which and that, yes. that feels bad. You yes. know, that's when it feels bad. So, but that's an interesting, I, I wasn't aware of Nietzsche's, um, comment on that, but I would I would expand on it, um, and maybe he said the same thing that I see yourself as an artist. You're a train station, and there's a lot. There's thousands of different trains. A lot of people, artists, I I notice, um, especially young artists when they're very young, starting out, they're looking for the train track, and they don't realise they're a station, and that to find out what your who you are in terms of style, don't think about it. Just try everything you can. And I actually learned that from high school too, um, when we had all these different artists. 
um, to just, you know, well, I'm not interested in that, but I have to do it, you know, like I know, portrait sculpting or something. It's not interested, but I'm going to do it. And then I learned, hey, I actually, there's bits of this I really like. Um, bronze casting, I've got no interest in working with metal. Wow, this is really cool, you know, and yeah, yeah. there's an aspect of myself coming out. Um, and so that's one thing I've pursued somewhat conscientiously as a um, illustrator is to try and do things that I initially don't like. So not always to do things that I like, to sort of experiment. And, um, and that's worked pretty well in, in being able to also be chameleonic. Oh, I think that's great advice. I mean, I, I teach as well, and I just think, yeah, just this whole thing of, you know, force yourself to do things you're not interested in because you just don't know. Yeah, at stage. and that's what school's yeah. great for. Yeah. And when yeah. you're working as an artist by yourself, one of the problems is that you, you've almost got too much freedom to do the things you like doing. Yeah. And you're not given these um, annoying assignments, but the annoying assignments can actually be, be pretty good. Ones. Yeah. 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 I'm kind of intrigued you talked about that moment too where you said that you when you you feel that you've grown from what you're doing mm. and I don't know I mean I don't even know if it's possible to articulate exactly what that is whether it's more than a feeling or whatever it is that you can say but I know that um, one of the the great joys of being involved with the creative visual arts and probably all arts but I, I know this you can lose sense of time you know mm -hmm. you can start something you can think where did the four hours go? You know, yeah, and, sure. And that to me is often a, a symbol or, or an indication of the of the engagement that you are doing the right thing for you at this time, and you are actually growing from. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it a similar experience? Yeah, or is it, sure. Yeah, it's like maybe it's a bit like a meditative state, and when it's working well, um, it feels as though you're using all parts of your being, like. Um, memory and it, all your all of your intelligence you know i don't think i don't feel like that most of the time i feel like i'm using a little tiny bit um but sometimes when painting and drawing um uh it feels like oh i'm getting into subtle complex decisions um and gathering lots of memory and experience and funneling it and i feel like um also i'm not i'm not puppeting the project anymore um it's just flowing naturally yeah. you know and i'm sure sports people have a similar experience too and and everybody when they're doing certain tasks yeah. Yeah. that there's a flow yeah. and it's quite it's quite good because it's not only really engaging and interesting and entertaining but it also um doesn't feel like hard work yeah. which it can be the opposite is also true that you can spend hours on a project and it feels like you're trying to resuscitate a corpse you know yeah. and and uh you're just going and going and going and <laughs> That's terrible, and I've never been as frustrated in my life as, as yeah. when doing art, yeah. um, and as well as happy, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not maybe, so it's got its own kind of happiness. It's not the same as other happiness in your life, but it's, there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know, when things are working well, uh, at least a fluidity, and the results don't, aren't always good, interestingly, but um, the, the, process, the process can be good, and that's, that's kind of the main thing. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So um, getting into your uh, um, tertiary study and you must have made, I, I know that um, during that period or maybe a little later, you started working, doing work for, now, am I saying this is Eidolon? It was the... Eidolon, uh, yeah. Eidolon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Australian, the Journal of Australian Science Fiction and Fantasy. Okay. So mm -hmm. you were making some connections uh, to the idea of doing illustration. Yes. How did, how did that sort of start for you? It started through an interest in science fiction writing. Um, and that would have been when I was maybe around 14, maybe 13 or 14. Um, and that sort of came about because um, I just started to become really fascinated by the Twilight Zone, these old reruns on late night TV when nobody else was watching TV. Um, they'd have the Twilight Zone on and um, way past my bedtime but I could set a VCR because it was like 1am or something they have these things on. I think I saw them when they first came out actually. Oh really? Yeah, I think uh, I was a kid and my brother was watching. Yeah them. I know my dad was a real fan so he was probably the one and my mum loves it too and um, and they were the ones that probably said you might like like this you know. Um, guy with a you know introducing smoking a cigarette yeah. and saying you know meet meet so and so. From yeah. The, in small town America, they're about to go into the twilight zone, and um, 
very dreamlike hypnotic stories with with weird endings and I I already liked those as a kid um, but that kind of led me to I, I was I didn't know much about science fiction and fantasy um, but I went to the local library and I, I said uh, you know because there's a very limited supply of these Twilight Zone episodes I said um, are there any books that are like the Twilight Zone like what is that what kind of story is that and and she said it's science fiction and fantasy and um, here's a bookmark and it's got a whole list of authors and uh, I started reading you know Isaac Asimov at the time I thought mm, interesting a bit robot oriented but it's okay and, and um, Arthur C. Clarke and, and Ray Bradbury's name was at the top and those stories really struck a chord with me the Ray Bradbury stories um, they were so weird and uh, um, and strange and um, sort of like adult fairy tales and with a total disregard for science because I wasn't interested in science fiction I don't okay. think I was interested yeah. in something else which was um, the sense that this reality may not be right. the right. only one right. there, there, might, there might be several realities overlapping and right. and Ray Bradbury is very much kind of about that um, and and seeing the bridge between dreams and storytelling that there's, they're kind of the same thing yeah um, and so that inspired me to, along with a lot of other science fiction writers, can't quite remember who they were, Brian Aldous, um, Arthur C. Clarke. Um, Robert Heinlein would have been. A little bit. Yeah. His was more hard, harder science and, and the sort of philosophical yeah. stuff. I think I read Stranger in a Strange Land and I was probably a little too young to understand what that was about. Um, but yeah, there were a, a number of Harry Harrison was a favourite. And the June trilogies would have been. June yeah, trilogies Frank been. Frank Herbert, um, all those all those pulp writers from the fifties and sixties. So I started seeking out those anthologies. Yeah, um, and uh, as well as some contemporary writers. And there was there was some magazines like Analog and I think Amazing Stories um, was still you know something I could actually find in my local newsagent in right. suburban Western Australia. Right, and. I came also across um, a magazine called Aurealis, which was a, an Australian magazine in my, you know, um, Whitford City shopping mall news agency <laughs> next to the barber. And my mum actually found it. She said, um, look at this. I found an Australian science fiction. It's Austra these are Australian writers writing science fiction short stories. And their artwork was woeful. <laughs> and um, my mum said, you could probably draw a better cover for this. And I thought, well, maybe. So I drew a robot kangaroo standing in the desert. And um, to give you an idea, I was 15 or 16 at the time. And to give you an idea of my sense of what you do to contact a magazine, I just folded the drawing up as <laughs> small as I could, <laughs> stuck it in an envelope, and just mailed it to them. And they said, this is great. We'll give you 50 bucks. Can we use it? Um, and I, I was like, wow. And then they published. So my first published professionally, I guess you could call it illustration, was when I was 16. Right. And you know, I took it to school, and I was like, "Look at this! I'm a published, <laughs> I'm a published illustrator." I hadn't actually um, been interested in illustration before that. I was interested in the magazine as a place to submit writing. Right. Yeah. And so that was your first connection to that to that genre, I suppose you could. That's call right. It. Yeah. Yes. But when when did the switch come? Because I know that you, you did you I you won 1995, 96 Ditmar Awards for the covers of those magazines. Have I got that right? Yes. So that would have been quite a long time afterwards so um yeah after yeah. The, after you being doing your first public yeah i've been doing yeah. a lot of so i basically through um aurealis didn't actually have internal illustrations for a long time but then they started to and that's a tradition of science fiction short story publications um they're one of the few genres that decades later still retains this idea of an illustration yeah, leading okay. a story yeah, okay. um, which is almost a very victorian idea yep. but it, it really works for science fiction because yep. there's always yep. a weird hook in the story and you yep. can represent that in a picture and there's a whole craft behind that which is now a little bit lost i think but as a you know in the in the golden age of science fiction there's a real skill for an artist to be able to summarize the weird concept behind a story without revealing too much as a leading to the, the the act of reading and um, so um, I also through Aurealis I became aware of a another magazine called Eidolon which I was very surprised to see was published in Perth and um, 
a group of friends had got together, I think, in the very early 90s or, or late 80s and decided Perth is a great place for this sort of thing. There's almost nothing around. So you think we were just going to make something, you know, Na the naivety <laughs> leads to actual production. And so they produced this as a very excellent um, science fiction magazine called Eidolon, um, which was uh, a little bit obscure because it was subscription only. You couldn't buy it from a shop. Right. Um, but a lot of the writers who cut their teeth on Eidolon are now really big name science fiction writers. Um, people like Greg Egan and Shaw oh, Williams okay. and Garth Nix and um, are moving into different genres. Um, Margot Lanigan might have had something to do with, with some of these. So did you ever write for them or, or any of those magazines? Did you actually submit any stories or was it just the Well, answer? yeah, that's a good question because at first I did. And... Um, to be honest, my writing was, was not great. It was good for my age, but I was still super young and inexperienced. And um, these other writers were like really good writers. And I quickly came to the realization that um, I'm not at that level. And, um, but I'm, I, I'd love to illustrate these other writers. I, you know, I don't care who writes the stories almost. I still like to be involved. And, um, and so I, I started illustrating a lot of these writers and I became the art editor of Eidolon. There was almost nobody doing this yeah, stuff. Yeah. There were only a handful yeah. of, um, it was pre-internet too, so it wasn't yeah, easy to yeah. find people. Yeah. And so they said, you know, we, could you be in charge of reading all the stories and sending them out to other artists? And I did that for a while. Um, which was an interesting experience to work as an editor and realise all the problems of working with artists. <laughs> and, Have you done the illustration yet? Oh, the deadline's coming up. So it gave me a real insight into what it's like from the other side. Um, in one issue of Eidolon, I had so much trouble getting the artwork from other artists, which was partly them, but also my lack of organisation that I ended up illustrating the whole magazine myself <laughs> but I changed styles so you couldn't tell. It looked like all different illustrators um, and I'm very proud of that edition because it's got, if you read closely it's like illustration by Sean Tan, illustration by Sean <laughs> but you can't tell looking at it. There's cartoon ones, there's photorealistic ones, a collage um, and uh, yeah that was a really good experience and I got to meet people because yeah. I, was, I was very isolated especially in Hillary's. Um, and I'm, I'm not a sociable person. And I, I mean, I, I sort of am way more now than I was then. I was extremely introverted. Didn't like going out and meeting people. In fact, that's one reason drawing and writing appealed to me. It was a way of communicating with others without having to face them. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, Eidolon was a, a good experience because I got to meet other writers and other illustrators. We would get together for dinners and, and little meetings and stuff and it sort of eased me out of this cave and um, realised that, uh, you know, hey, there's a lot of people out there. Well, first of all, I'm not a weirdo. Um, and secondly, there's a lot of people out there that value this stuff and they, they get it, you know, like we all get each other. Yeah. Um, and I'd go to science fiction conventions. They, they always felt a bit strange to me, but um, my first ever exhibitions were... You, you still have an interest in science fiction, I assume? Or yeah, not yeah so I do, but broadly. So oh, yeah. I feel that um, over the years, I've drifted across different cultural spheres, you know, children's literature, fine art, science fiction, comics. They're all these different spheres mm -hmm. and they intersect like a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm always sitting in those little intersections somewhere, but I never quite have a grasp of the whole field or identify with a, a group. So science, the science fiction world is like the comics world. It's deep and complex and it requires like full on constant study to keep abreast of what's going on and I, I don't really I don't really have that level of engagement yeah I'm astonished when I pick it up and look at it how good their draftsmanship is like that always yeah, I know. always amazes me you know yeah, they yeah. just must be drawing all the time but look I, I wanted to make ask this though that in this period where you're you're doing this work for um, these magazines and then you know it's not that far away because in 2000 the lost thing comes out okay uh -huh. um, roughly there. so somewhere in that period 
you really developed your skills and style, if, if you can call it that. Uh -huh. Where did that come from? I mean, was that just essentially just working away by yourself and just experimenting? I yeah, I think so. And it was, it was probably the um, synthesis of a number of different things that I was doing simultaneously, which were didn't on the surface not very related to each other. So one was, um, and which people don't know much about, is like my fine arts painting, which is mostly landscapes. And that was always my primary interest too. Um, so illustration was kind of like an interesting side interest, but my main interest as an artist was painting um, suburban and rural West Australian landscapes in a semi-abstracted way. Yep. Um, and it's still my one of my interests and I've had a number of exhibitions recently where I actually started showing this work. Um, so that kind of, there's a stylistic influence there that bleeds into all my other work and it's something to do with space, colour, form, relationships, visual relationships and um, I was very inspired by painters such as um, in the beginning when I was a teenager, Arthur Streeton and those Heidelberg artists yep. and the way they captured light, yep. that sort of Australian Impressionism. Um, and then later on, um, artists, you know, some more figurative um, artists that involved uh, distortion like the post-impressionists and um, artists like Brett Whiteley, Fred Williams, um, John Olson, where they're starting to abstract you know the landscape and actually you, you're seeing think tuning in more to what your mind is seeing than what your eye is seeing and this is really interesting and, and again i'm always a little bit conscious that uh anyone listening or watching this would be aspirational for their own illustration work as well and i i know you've written a fair bit about um or a little bit about um how you 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 set up models and I, I had to say I laughed so much when I read about the monsters in um, you know those cyclopic kind of monsters in the um, arrival where you dressed yourself up <laughs> yeah yeah I know destroyed cardboard boxes yeah and... it's like god thank god I had walls and curtains you know because some of the stuff I was doing just, just so looked funny. bizarre and then you, you photographed it and you used yourself as model and I've yeah. seen I've seen there's a beautiful uh, photograph of um, I guess their family member sitting around the table and then you've used that yes kind of like as a joint but well, one of the things I think often um, younger people or, or people who are just beginning with illustration, you talked about the abstraction of landscape and, you know, from, say, Street into Olsen. Mm -hmm. But how did you go about learning those, those, very, those very simple yet very elusive techniques, say, of laying down a watercolour wash mm -hmm. and things like that? Where did that come from? Okay. Um, high school first. Yeah. Really good grounding in high school. And, and most of the technical skills that I use now day to day I got from high school. Right. There's, there's not really, I think with traditional painting, there's probably a lot that I have yet to learn, but I'm too lazy to learn it. But there's um, there's not a lot you need to know. I mean, paint is colored mud on cloth. That's it, you know? There's different ways you can put it on and take it off. Um, and once you've figured those out, it's all about then what you do with it in terms of concepts. And like, so the technical side of things is, um, I've never felt that has been too difficult but I always to answer your question mostly learnt by looking at other artists work right. and especially in a gallery because you, I can look at a painting I can figure out how they did it and um, even, even from a young age were you able to do that as well were you yeah you, if you're interested enough yeah. and I remember studying those street and paintings and I was, I was thinking there's this wonderful kind of um, way that they had of, of really emphasizing the brush strokes and I was like well, how's, how's this possible? And then when I went to the gallery, I looked closely, and I could see that it's kind of almost they've um, put a wash over a painting. They painted it all and then put a wash over and wiped the wash off right. and like an old master technique. And yeah. so the paint, the colours catch in all the grooves. Yeah. And so I realised, oh, so they're actually often painting things knowing that's coming rather than painting exactly like what they're seeing yes. Yes. Um, and planning for these steps. And they look very natural and spontaneous, but they're not. Um, so seeing those little things that an artist is creating spontaneous effects, you know, in a very calculated way, um, you can see there's nothing hidden in a painting really. Right. When you look at a painting, um, the good paintings, 
it's laid bare, you know. The, the very confident artist said, this is how I, I do it. You know, you look at a Francis Bacon or something, it's like, it's all there. There's no, nothing really, no trickery involved. In I really like opaque paints. Acrylics? You're using acrylics? Or yeah, the rabbits and gouache, which I was using a lot when I started out as an illustrator. Right. Um, which is like watercolour, you know, yeah. you've got the little cakes and as well as some liquid paints, so you mix it with water and put it on. How, how did you cope, say, with the last thing with that? If it, that's all oil painting, I didn't realise that, but how did you cope with the drying times on things like just that? Just do several pictures at once. Right. Yeah, and um, the good thing about that book is the palette is pretty much the same across yep. the whole book. So yep. um, I would have, th I'd be rotating three paintings at, at once, I remember. Um, the drying time's not that bad. People always make a big deal about it, but I'm such a slow painter <laughs> that acrylics frustrate me because they dry too fast. Too quickly, yeah, it's like okay. it's just drying too quickly. I'm still okay. working here. Okay. <laughs> um, plus, there's different media that you can use. Um, 24 hours that it'd be touch dry. I'm not. I'm not doing like, at least with that book, big impasto effects. Yes. Okay. Um, and there's certain paints, certain colours like lemon yellow and alza and red and so on. They take it forever to dry, so you just avoid them. Right. Right. So if you're reaching for, and, and I've probably seen it in, um, is it, what's the one, it's not the backyard stories, you've done one recently, it's, is it the, the Japanese um, story, I forgot the title of the book, hang on, I've got it here. Um, Broken the Toys? Cicada. The Cicada. Cicada. That all the Japanese time. story. <laughs> yeah. It is a Japanese story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sort of, it's, it's being translated in, at the moment into Japanese. But, oh, um, well, it's interesting that you picked oh, up on that, because I... <laughs> I often thought, yeah, this is like the Japanese salaryman. Uh, yeah, 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 that's what I thought when I read it. And I, and I but you're the first person to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> complete error. But yeah. I, the only reason why I picked that one out is that looks like it's all oil painting. It is. As well. Yes. So if you're reaching for a technique, that seems to be your go-to for books. It is um, always with this. And kind yes. Of still is actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's often my fallback, and I, I I will try other media, and then I go, ah, I just do it in oils, you know. Right. Um, right. I also like pastel crayon as well, um, but it's the final illustrations are not very stable. But that's my other favourite medium, and also just straight pencil. Stable in the sense, but the the surface can be damaged. That's right. Yeah. Whereas oil paint, um, the paintings themselves are so robust. Right. Um, you know, you can you can eat your dinner off them and they're fine. <laughs> you know, you go tobogganing on an oil painting, and you'll be fine. Oh, that's quite amazing. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Um, We've moved, all right, so we've moved out of that science fiction period and you, you, you come into the scene with The Lost Thing, but there are other books there as well, The Red Tree, which I, I just think is a great book. I really love that book. But I guess the one that seemed to capture people's imagination in a big way was The Rabbits. Mm -hmm. It seemed to sort of, to me, from my memory of it, and was that it burst onto the scene and in a publishing context. And I, I want to make this connection with publishing because that's sort of my agenda with these um, uh, with these uh, interviews. How connected were you to publishing as an industry when this when these sort of early books were starting to appear? Did you did you have a very close connection to publishing by that time? What What do you mean? Well, were you were you uh, being commissioned by them to do those works, or were you were you sorting them out yourself, trying to contact them to ask them to do those? Yeah, works? I was. I was. Um, well, let me ask this: What was your first connection to a book publisher for doing a work? How it would have been that? okay. It would have been um, Lothian Books right. back when they were um, they were independent, um, medium sized publisher based in Port Melbourne at yeah. the time. Yeah, and. That came about because uh, one of the authors who was associated with Eidolon and Aurealis, um, a guy named Steve Paulson, um, I used to do free illustrations for him for his Australian science fiction writers newsletter. So yep. he put out this thing and I'd draw decorations on it. He, um, he uh, had a... a children's story accepted as part of a series of horror stories that Lothian was doing. Uh, okay. And he put my name forward as a possible illustrator. Um, Gary Crew was the series yes. editor. Right. There was a series called After Dark. He happened to be visiting Fremantle to do a residency at the, what was then called the Fremantle Children's Literature Centre. And he, he said, um, hey, uh, do you want to have dinner? 
and um, we can meet. And so I, I went down to Fremantle and I had dinner with him and I showed him my folio. And um, prior to that, I think we'd had a little bit of exchange by phone and fax. I think this was pre-internet just, yeah. but pre-email. Yeah. And he'd shown some interest in my in my work. But I remember that, um, and Helen Chamberlain was the editor and she was very open-minded about working with me um, based on Stephen's recommendation. But they gave me a, a trial, you know, they said, here's a story, send us a few illustrations. I did, I did a couple and they liked them. And so I, I can't remember if they just straight away gave me a contract, but that was like my first contracted book illustration project. And were you aware of other book illustrators at that time? Do you, were you conscious of their work at that time? Not, maybe a little bit, but not so much. I hadn't thought that much about children's literature. Right. And, um, but I was aware that there was a lot of crossover, especially in genre fiction. Like if you're a science fiction fantasy or horror writer, at some point you're gonna do YA at least. Right. It just naturally yeah. goes into that territory. And then yeah. children's, but I hadn't really thought about picture books, um, picture books that much. Um, this was my early 20s and I'd just come out of that uni degree and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of a bit worried about here I am, I am this unemployed artist, which was a <laughs> thing I feared. And I was lugging my folly around to design studios, yeah, WA okay. Museum, um, anywhere I could think of that could need a yeah. drawing. Yeah. Um, and I was almost going to move to Sydney to join a, a friend there who had been kind of a, you know, science fiction illustration mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of, uh, to work, probably doing work for a computer game company or something. Right. But I, I really needed to be doing something. And I started to think about children's literature because... Um, I noticed that just looking around, okay, there's, there's a lot of need for, they produce a lot of stuff, you yeah. know, children's literature sector. Yeah. There's a lot of illustrators working there. Yeah. I was paying my rent um, by doing, I managed to also score a job with HarperCollins. This was maybe just before the Lothian stuff, um, doing covers for fantasy novels. And that came about because one of the writers, um, Sarah Douglas, um, or Sarah Warniki, who's a Bendigo writer, mm -hmm. happened to be visiting a Perth science fiction convention and she saw my work up on the wall. Right. And she hated the cover, I don't know if I should say this, but <laughs> probably old enough now, that doesn't matter. Um, she hated the the cover of one of her books okay. that they had, and wouldn't, I knew wouldn't why. Be, it, wouldn't be the first time, by the way. Yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, such a shocking thing. <laughs> um, but it was it was actually a well painted cover, but it was by an artist who didn't understand the genre. Mm -hmm. So this is what I found was the case often with illustrators. They were either really new to the genre, or they couldn't and they couldn't draw well, or they could draw really well, but they didn't understand a dragon isn't just anything it's got certain rules if yeah. you're going to paint a dragon okay. um and so sarah that this book was really popular it was going into reprint and sarah said you know here's this young guy um he can do a cover if it's crap don't use it you've already got the other cover and and so that was my first job that was my first contact with a real publisher but it was i wouldn't i'm not really sure if I would call that illustration in the sense of what we're talking about here because it was more like when you do cover art it's a very different purpose it's yeah. almost advertising yeah. you know there's not a lot of yeah concepts yes I mean you can be yeah. probably any kind of illustrator and have your work used on a book cover it's quite yeah. possible for that to happen yes actually, you know because we just you know we, we we quite often take fine art works and put them onto a book sure yeah, so. yeah but Okay, so that brings me into the, that core world of the publishing industry. And you mentioned Helen Chamber before, yes. Chamber before and she, she's been a big part of your publishing life. You know, mm -hmm. she's been with you for a long time. Still is. Yeah, no, okay. still, still, the last book her. I did, I first person I showed it to was yeah. Helen. And I have read a little bit about, um, you know, what she thinks books are and things like that. But you, mm -hmm. you tell me, what, what, as you got into this and you started, and you were narrowing that down to, say, picture books, children's. Mm children's literature, children's book. What, what was your understanding of what a book is and what you wanted a book to be? Well, it's interesting because um, the moment I started um, through that After Dark, and I was doing these After Dark books, so after I did one, I did um, a bunch of others, 
and I'd met Gary and he had recently published The Water Tower, mm -hmm. which was quite a breakthrough sort of picture book mm -hmm. in that it was um, very weird and strangely enough, straight out of Twilight Zone in terms of the style. Right. Right. And um, there was an exhibition at the Fremantle Literature Centre, um, which previously I didn't know about this place, um, but they invited me to come and have a look and Gary said, um, go and look and see how, how picture books are done. He was very big on this concept as am I now, that picture books, good picture books are based on this principle of um, parallel stories, one told with words, one told with pictures, but they don't have to intersect. In fact, they can go, they can even contradict each other. And so you're interested in the dynamic between these two elements and the water tower is a good example, very simple, good example by the um, very good late illustrator, Steve Warman. Okay. And um, he was also a very young illustrator too, so I could relate to what he was doing because there was some similarity in our styles. Right. And um, in the water tower, these these two boys go for a swim in the water tower, but the, the, the text talks about the um, from the point of view of one boy waiting for his friend to go back and get um, his bathers or something. And um, the pictures are showing a whole other thing. <laughs> so it's like the pictures were separate and the book rotate. So there's all this, because Steve was a very good book designer. So there's all this weird design stuff. Yeah, okay. And um, the ending is perplexing. So it was like a really good example of a picture book to start me off on on this journey. And, and I started to realize, um, oh, okay, you can actually, they're not just for kids. That's a, like little kids. I always thought that, um, of picture books as early childhood things. I said, okay, so there's these other ones. And that reminded me of others that I did already know about that hadn't thought about much, like Raymond Briggs and so on, um, you know, that are complex picture books that are also kind of for adults or, or older readers. And I thought, well, this is something I could get interested in. Right. Um, because I, at that point, I had no real understanding about children, um, I remember I, I went and I gave a talk at, about illustration at my old primary school and I was just breaking a sweat because I was like, what are these <laughs> creatures? What do I say to them? Um, so I had no real relationship to, to young kids. It's different now. I'm very comfortable around them um, and able to understand them creatively. But um, I was thinking, you know, I'm really interested in adult science fiction and this was quite close to that. So after that, I spent some time just studying picture books and I was... Um, yeah, go to a bookstore or a library and, and just start getting out all these and looking at the CBC awards list, you know, going, so what are the picture books that have won prizes in Australia? And um, I started to get an understanding of the culture, you know, that there was a kind of a, a certain ideology behind picture books at, at this place and time and there were certain styles and there were certain illustrators. And... Um, Yes, you know, just that, really that's appreciate so interesting. their work. That, that is actually really interesting because I feel like, you know, I, I'm a child of publishing. I got my first publishing job was virtually the first job I got and I stayed in it forever. Oh, yes. And you're coming from the outside and you're just saying, well, look, this has got a certain set of rules about it. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I'm on the inside. So what rules? You know, this yeah. is the real world over here. Yes. <laughs> it's so interesting that you came from the outside. Yeah, and, I think know. I that's, that's maybe one reason why um, my work was received as original mainly I didn't know what I was doing and <laughs> and that's certainly the case with the rabbits because when that came along um, and also an interesting thing happened um, that I uh, at the same time I was asked to do the rabbits I I was getting into this whole you know illustration thing like yeah maybe I'm an illustrator and so I, the, I entered some work into this um, award in France and then I got the invitation in the mail that said, oh, you know, the exhibition opens in Paris. And I was like, well, they accepted my work. So I booked a trip to Paris. This was my first big trip outside of, you know, um, by myself, you know, to another country. And I visited this um, exhibition and uh, my work wasn't there because I misunderstood the invitation. <laughs> but, um, and it was a terrible trip because I got really ill as well, but I did go to this exhibition and it had quite an effect on me because there was all of these French illustration students, something I hadn't studied because I hadn't studied illustration at some tertiary level. Yes, yeah. 
and uh, and they'd done this inter uh, the assignment was they'd had to interpret um, creation myths from around the world, and there's all these wacky styles and really bizarre. Some of it was completely abstract, almost abstract expressionist illustration. Um, but that at first, when I was offered this, the rabbits as a text, and it was after I'd started working with Gary Crew a lot, and then Helen said, you might be interested in this, because we're not quite sure, you know, what to do with this text from John Marsden. And at first I was like, I don't know what to do with it either, but after seeing that exhibition, I suddenly realised, you can do anything with a book. It doesn't have to be, um, there's no tradition that's, you know, and, and this text that John wrote is not, doesn't feel like it's within any particular tradition either. And I know John was not that experienced necessarily with picture books too. So he was, you'd have to ask him, but I got the impression he was a bit of a novice at picture books. It was maybe his third go at writing a picture right. book. Right, okay. And it's not a genre that he's well known for either. Um, and so uh, the, the two of us were kind of both somewhat you know, what is the picture book like? Almost knowing nothing much about what's good or bad and just thinking, what can you do? And so I had this um, uh, sudden interest in doing a book that pushes illustration as far as I can. So instead of trying to constantly contain it, thinking, well, what do the editors want me to do and what am I meant to do? And I thought, I'm just going to like draw the wackiest thing that I can and see what they say. And if they say no, I'll just change it. So I just started to really push it, and um, um, that was helped by John Marsden's text because it's really hard to illustrate that text, literally. It's like doesn't make sense if you illustrate exactly what he's oh, saying. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and so that that tension between perhaps what the publishing industry was trying to do and your your viewing it from the outside and maybe not completely more. Well, obviously not completely meshing with it. You, it seems to me like you've kept that tension going. Has that been a, a deliberate thing where you you feel comfortable with that tension in the fact that, that the storytelling's going to be kind of always to some degree idiosyncratic or layered, as you said, you know, where multiple mm. stories are happening like that? Because it, it seems to me that all of your work and, you know, definitely everything probably since Rabbits, you know, it always is this element to me of tension about it, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not quite settled or you know, yeah. in place, you know, they're always on this kind of like buzzing kind of other reality going. Like yeah, that. but I wouldn't, yes, but I, I don't think it's conscious. Like, I'm not trying to do that. Right. Um, it's just those are the things I like, you know, so from project to project, it's just part of the big question for myself is do I like this idea enough because I'm very slow and it's a big commitment to take on a picture book for me. I know other illustrators um, can be quite quick and, and you know, do a book in three months or something, but for me it's like a, uh, especially at the time doing books like The Rabbits, it's like a, uh, 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 each book was like doing a PhD or something, so I'm in this for a real long time, I better like it. And so I had quite a few manuscripts that were put to me, that they were great manuscripts, but I just, I thought this, this is not quite clicking with me enough. I, I can feel myself getting depressed halfway through after spending, you so know. What, what is a good manuscript when you get a manuscript? What, what, what really speaks to you? Or what sort um, of thing might speak to you? Um, it has to be different illustrators like different things. For me, I liked a text which um, didn't actually give me any idea of what to illustrate, so not descriptive at all. And it's interesting because The Rabbits was maybe a very formative example because when I first received that, I didn't like it because it wasn't giving me enough information. And it was only after struggling with it for some time that I realized that is the blessing of this project. This is, it gives me no information yeah. and I have to write. I have to be a writer again. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not just an illustrator. And I learned that working with Gary Crew because he was very much about that. You are a writer just as he was an illustrator too. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just because we one works with pictures and one works with words, doesn't mean that's our thinking domain. We're thinking across each other. Yeah. And a good illustrator is a good writer. Was Gary Crew looking at your roughs as you worked through the process? Yeah, or? yeah. So we worked very collaboratively. Right. And that's why it was also a bit of, um, a bit confusing uh, to then receive the John Marsden project in between two books I was working on with Gary because John had no interest in working collaboratively. 
um, only because he didn't feel confident in having anything wise to say about visuals. He just said, I don't know anything about that. These are the words. And also the words were set. That was it. You know, with Gary, it was like, here's a draft. Let's work with it. And I would say, you know, you want to, I think we need more writing here. Um, but get rid of this part here because I can do a picture for that. Is that, that a preference for you to, to be in a close collaboration with the, um, the writer? With Gary it was because that was a really good working relationship and we both understood each other really well. And he, he was sort of a mentor as well. So um, I, could, I could defer to him. Right. And, and I wasn't a very confident artist at that time. So if, um, if I was in doubt, I'd say, Gary, what, what should I do? And he would say, you should do maybe like this. And I would just go, great, that's that solves that problem. Yeah. Um, in fact, as later on, I revisited the, the viewer and I, I edited it again because I came at it from a different perspective of having more confidence and understanding what I was trying to do more. And uh, um, I asked Gary to rewrite the oh, book okay. a little bit again. Right. So it's interesting to compare those two editions. Um, but yes, um, these days I don't work collaboratively uh, mainly in an ideal world I would um, but I have such a backlog of interesting personal projects um, and and to be honest um, I also came to the realization uh, around the time that I started working on the lost thing that I need to start writing again because otherwise I'm going to starve <laughs> because I, I the, the economics of picture books I have to say I mean I don't know if it's changed since with collaborative things but the ones I started off with um, and I'm not afraid to say this openly but the economics <laughs> sucked those contracts were terrible you know um, but they were fair across the board because it was all different kinds of illustrator but for an illustrator like me and the kind of work I do not a good contract oh, look Sean it's common common still a common problem um, yeah. as, as you say you know like uh, illustration that's so involved that might take someone to do a week you know, or two weeks for a spread mm. are essentially going to get the same money for someone who could whip one out in an hour. That's right, yeah. And, yeah, so publishers don't easily discriminate between those sorts of things. You know, the job is seen as a complete book and yes. it's paid accordingly to that. So that, I don't yeah. think that's changed very much. And they're very yeah. difficult discussions to have because um, it does risk insulting the writer's contribution. So I figured the only way I can get around this is I write my own stuff. Uh, yeah. And that's really why I did the lost thing. Yeah. And the other reason for doing the lost thing was um, I was starting to get typecast as an illustrator who does dark books about social issues. And I, I was like, yes, I, I am interested in those things. But um, I could see all these other illustrators getting the funny stories. <laughs> and so I want some funny stories. And because uh, I'm, a, you know, I like humor. And so, um, you know, Memorial, The View of the Rabbits, there's not much humor in them. I mean, I was trying to inject a little bit, especially in The Rabbits, it's got some funny parts in there. But um, it's, it's dire. And, um, and I was getting, you know, these manuscripts that were like war, death, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, and uh, because there was, there seemed to be this this good movement of, of these kind of books at the time. This is around the mid to late nineties. There was a lot of real interesting books yeah. on tough social topics. And uh, so I, I did the lost thing because I thought I want to do a, a comic, you know, quite funny, um, more comic in both sense of the words, funny and also breaking the pictures into panels and playing with text and image and cartoon-like characters. Well, yeah, you kind of bring me on to something else I wanted to talk about too, and probably something that maybe doesn't get recognised very much, but the work you do on all of your books, and you know, especially The Arrival, it's one that made me look at it very closely, is the design. And mm -hmm. I want to separate that a little bit out from the illustration part of it, or the, or the narrative part of it. But you are really, really careful about how you're laying out spreads and where you're putting things, things in. I, I just take it that um, that came naturally, naturally to you. Uh, yeah. Um, because I, I wasn't very good at it. Up, yeah, I'm going to bring that yeah. up because a lot of illustrators are not, and they tend mm. to sort of do their work and then they step away and let someone else, you know, do all that for them. Mm -hmm. too much. And I started off doing that. Yeah. Um, and then I would learn from what they did, um, what designers did, and, and, and get a better understanding of what you could do. Yeah. 
Um, that's one thing lacking in my education. If I went back and did it again, I would have studied design a lot more. Right. Um, Why would you say that? Because I was, I, I just really struggled um, trying to communicate with designers and I had a lot of difficulties with the first few books and I was very depressed about some of the design right? decisions. Right. Yeah. What, what sort of, you know, in a general sense, what sort of... The biggest one was having to use big fonts. Ah, and okay. my case yeah. was these are not yeah. books for early readers. Interesting. You know, yeah. there's no reason. And also a little word is just as readable as a big word when there's only five on the page. It oh, really doesn't sure. matter. You, you, you're telling me something I like. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have this constant conversation with editors and publishers is that um, it, the readability of type isn't about size. It's yeah, about, no, it's not. It, it's about the space that's around it. You know, since many other exactly. factors as well, you know, colour plays a part, the position on the page plays, all those sorts of things play a yeah. part as well. But I, I'm, I'm absolutely astonished how you just picked this up as you, you went along because it, it's not a, an easy, intuitive skill to learn unless you do a lot of it. Maybe. I still struggle with design, to be honest. That's that's the one where I feel the least confident. And um, fortunately, I married a graphic designer. Uh. So that <laughs> helps. Like She designed... Um, she had quite a lot of input on the arrival, right. like um, when I was stuck with something. I said, right. what do you, especially the cover and, and, and those bits that have anything that's got text or typography, because yeah. she's yeah. like brilliant with typography. Yeah. And she did um, all of Tales from Outer Suburbia. And I basically just said, here it is. It's lovely. Whatever you do, well, that's that's fine. She's done a beautiful job on that. I don't yeah, yeah. That. yeah. And so, uh, and then I, I check things with her all the time. So that's helps me to learn and also um, just to have a bit more confidence when dealing with typography but I still not I feel it's one area that I should have studied a lot more I didn't know I was going to be dealing with words so much um, in my in my career and um, it's also one reason why you'll see in a lot of early projects I hand letter it's yeah. like my way of getting around the problem of what yeah. what font to choose yeah. is oh, well I'll just draw it by hand and at least I, I trust that this is honest you know I was absolutely delighted when, and maybe this uh, wasn't your work, but I assume it was your work with the uh, typographic uh, alphabet that you created in the arrival with the oh, cutting yes. of the letters. That was all, all of your work, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yes. I laughed when I saw that. Oh, I really? thought, well, my typographic students should actually look at this page oh, and really? do this for themselves yeah. because it's that abstract positioning of letter forms, you know, in particular ways just to get the balance Yeah, that's right true, actually. Letter. Yeah, because uh, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. No, it's very hard. Yeah, very hard. and try to make it look um, nice. Yeah. And I did it pretty crudely, I have to say, because I think um, I'm actually quite impatient. Uh, I don't know, I'm a balance between patience and impatience, but when I get an idea, it's just like I just need to <laughs> move it along. And I know from experience that um, when you're a visual artist doing this kind of very finicky work, um, ideas can die on the vine, you know, if they just spend too much time. I'm very keen to move things along. Um, and the other thing about design was um, just being able to, the early books I had a lot of trouble because I was in Perth and the publisher was in Melbourne and um, it was also, I remember when it used to cost a fortune to burn a CD for instance, so it was really difficult to actually communicate yeah. ideas and yeah. um, I must have annoyed them as well, as well as them finding me quite annoying. I mean, as well as I found them annoying, they found me annoying. And it's partly because it's just so hard to sort of say, mm, just move it, move it up a bit. Wait a minute, move it back, you know, and this sort of stuff. It's like, I don't know if it's right until I see it. And well, um, it definitely... when now that I design my own work, at least in the first pass, I, I like to give it to a designer to then fix that I like to design my own work just so I can do all the mistakes first. But those conversations certainly are much easier to have now. What, what, tell me, what's your relationship like now with publishing books and publishing? I mean, what, 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 are you, what, what are you hoping to do in the future with, in that area as being a, a book illustrator and creating book narrative? Are you, I mean, you've done a lot of work recently and mm. um, there's still more to come? It sounds like you've got more to yeah, come. Yeah, sure. Um, I never really can see that far ahead. Um, maybe I can see there's always ideas for possible things to develop um, and, uh, and they haven't quite reached that critical mass yet where they're starting to fuel themselves and so they're just floating ideas. Um, lately I've been gathering a lot of old 
drawings together and, and looking at ways to, to publish those as, you know, just a bunch of interesting pictures without stories. You, you've still got publishers coming to you with manuscripts and saying, would you be interested no. in this? Um, do I? No. I, well, it's interesting, no, I don't because, well, sometimes, but I, I always say no, so they just give up. <laughs> um, and it's, and always with great regret, you know, it's like, this is terrific. I'd love to, and I like to recommend other illustrators. And I, you know, I sort of enjoy that sort of slightly unsolicited art director role where I like say, well, if, if I was doing it, I would do it like this. And I would, I'd think you need this and this and this. And, um, there was a book recently that, that came across my table like that. And I was, I was happy to see that some of my comments actually had an influence uh, good. on the art direction okay. of the book. Um, I'm, I'm very big on separation of word and image where possible, so don't mix them up too much. Yeah, okay. Um, in fact, I still have some discomfort with words on picture, and maybe that tension drives a lot of creative investigation because so it... So your layout sense would always want you to create sort of a very neutral space for the... For something the like that, yeah. I mean, other artists and designers are good at ramming those things together and, and enjoying that fray of all that stuff sorting itself out on the page, like especially comics creators, they, yeah. they do some amazing stuff. But um, for me, um, I, I, you know, I'm kind of still a, a writer who likes to paint and a painter who likes to write, but I don't like mixing them yeah, okay. too much. Yeah, I like okay. to keep them um, separate. I've, I've almost never drawn a speech bubble in my pictures. I just can't bring myself to do it. It's like the words are getting into the picture too much. Um, yeah, I, look, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I have a, a, something of a saying that to, for designers, for book covers, the, the minute you resort to a panel, you've lost your way. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, because you just don't want to be obliterating the imagery you're working with. You want to, yes. you want it to sit together correctly. Yeah. Um, so panels, you just can't use them. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and just too many elements yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but what, what are you what are you hoping to say about perhaps with future books and what, what sort of what sort of direction um, are you hoping to take yourself in or is it is it just too conscious a decision to make? I don't know maybe I should sit down and sometimes <laughs> when I'm asked to like organise an exhibition yeah. and there's that chance to have a little retrospective or write an intro to and that's the time or even speak at a conference then I suddenly realise oh there's a trajectory here maybe. I should do more work like this, you know, because um, there's parts of my work that I like and parts I don't like. And um, I, I'm always driving towards something that, I, that feels interesting, but also honest. It has to be honest. Um, and I'm really scared of falling into the trap of doing cool illustration that everybody likes, you know, um, because it's a very appealing thing to do. Um, and uh, I want it to be uh, a bit of an adventure too, but I'm not afraid to repeat something if it's if it feels comfortable. So I don't believe to, you know you have to be constantly breaking boundaries and all this stuff. It just has to. The boundary breaking is a symptom of being honest. Like when you're doing honest yeah. work, it yeah. ends up being original and boundary breaking yeah. somehow because you just think. Um, I'm, I'm going to do what feels right rather than what's the right way yeah. to do it. And I guess, you know, what you're saying too, many of the themes that have been in your books, you know, that, that sense of seeing a, a usual thing in an unusual way, you know, they're very universal and they never seem to get tired in that sense. You can keep reinventing yes. that, that kind of perspective, whereas you're saying those, yes. those parallel stories where you keep layering them, you can keep going with that forever, yeah. those kinds of ideas. That's true. And... I notice too that I, I often tell the same story, um, so uh, which I, I'm not worried about, but there's this big theme of home and belonging. Yeah. I'm not sure where that comes from, but it, it's something that comes out um, all the time. And I, you know, I'm thinking about a story at the moment and it's, it's very much again in that territory, you know. Um, do, do you feel at home? Like like now, after all these years of working at it and being very successful, do you, do you feel like you belong and have, have a sense mm, of home? Not sure. 
my wife and I often talk about that because um, we live in Melbourne and we're from yeah. Perth and she's from Finland, so she's yeah. like displaced, displaced. Yeah. And I don't feel entirely at home. I may, I don't know, there's a funny paradox. Like I think home sometimes is something like with the Wizard of Oz, you appreciate it when you're not there. <laughs> but then I also have there's some place in my, um, somewhere in the dreams of my childhood that really feels like a, um, that there is maybe a, a, a feeling of, of what it's, maybe not a home, because that place of my childhood doesn't feel like a home to me, but it, there's some feeling of real anchorage there, which could be one reason why I've come into the world of children's literature, whether so I want to or not. You're talking about that early family life? Is that what Yeah, you're I think to? so, because yeah. it felt very stable, or at least like a fish tank yeah. kind of world in suburban Hillary's where I grew up. Um, and it also felt like forever, you know, like I was a century there. I lived there for one century and everything else after that has happened pretty f <laughs> in an accelerated rate. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there's elements, like sometimes I stop and I try to analyze my own work. So I look at the lost thing and this, this world at the end of the lost thing where there's all these creatures and that. I'm thinking, well, what is that place? Um, maybe it's um, kindergarten, something like that. Um, I'm not sure, but there was maybe uh, a period in my life when I was a young child where I was obliviously engaged in the world without reflection. And now that I'm an adult, especially as artists, like the, the worst kind of, you know, <laughs> level of reflection, um, it's very, it's funny because you get to this heightened conscious reflective state in order to yeah. get, get access to the yes. unreflective. Yes. Um, oneness yes. uh, with the world you, that you're trying to get a glimpse into like and the yes. lost thing is all about there's doors opening up so you can um, see these like uh, childhood um, worlds of uh, um, I don't know just uncomplicated um, experience of and in a way you know like and I've, I've avoided asking you the question about who are your audience is I've really don't want to ask you that, but you've actually kind of answered it because you've shown in that 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 sense of finding your home is actually a child's place, and you speak to that. Mm -hmm. And I, that seems to me an obvious audience for children. Yeah, for sure. That. Yeah. Now listen, we, we have to finish it. I mean, we, time is um, uh, running out, mm -hmm. but I just want to give you one chance. I mean. What do you think? And I, I, I try and ask all illustrators this. What do you think the future of books is like? You know, it's it's under it seems under threat. You know, uh -huh. um, with all kinds of economic pressures and things like that. And mm. readers, you know, as they get um, as you know, readers of say my age get older, book buying is becoming you know quite demonstrably less. Right. So, well, how do you feel? And what do you think when you look ahead for the mm -hmm. the world of books and maybe in particular children's books? Where, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, not, not particularly. I, I think I've lately, especially I've had my nose so close to the grindstone in a creative sense that I haven't, you know, it's only when I look up and a book comes out and I become aware of, you know, what's happening in the publishing right. scene and, and the culture of books. Um, I mean, it, it sort of feels like this is the mantra of my whole career is books are under threat, you know, um, <laughs> and picture books especially. Although they've had, they've had more resilience than most. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I've always felt that they would. Yeah. Because, um, uh, you know, other books work okay on other platforms. Picture books still is yeah. way better printed. And yeah. also, um, yeah. because a picture book has always been an object. Yeah. And this is one thing we forget about art is that art is primarily about objects. You know, that's this, that's something that's very basic. Um, yeah. Not all art, but I think there's something deeply, uh, we respond with our bodies to the art object, art facts, the made object, yeah, yeah, things yeah, you can hold yeah, and so on. Absolutely. And it's not a fetish because some people get fetishistic about books. It's something yeah. deeper than that. Yeah. Um, and there's something wonderful about the illusion of story and space and another world 
um, on a material object that is ink on paper. So it's the ultimate kind of magic trick. And so the book is a magical object. And that's absolutely correct. I mean, it's seldom talked about, but you know, the way we hold them, the distance we hold them from our face, mm. the way we view them from three dimensional uh, different kinds of uh, viewpoints, mm -hmm. they are to some degree more akin to sculpture in some ways, yes. as opposed to actually a flat two dimensional object, yeah. which they're often thought about. So yes. they are very, very durable. And, in that sense, but the generally overall, you know, there is a sense that this industry will suffer a great deal in in years to come. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah, it may do, and 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 who's to say like that the kind of the way I work might become redundant. I mean, I've been fairly adaptable moving into animation and so on, but I feel um, there might be limits there. So lately i've been approached a lot by vr companies right. and i just have zero interest in it right right um why, why is that why is that? not sure um my experience of it is oh, I, I look at it and i think well this could be cool for gaming but i i don't really feel there's something conceptually doesn't i'm sure examples will come um where i'll go okay now this is this is working you know this is makes sense um but i haven't seen that so much. I haven't seen any examples where I thought this is a remarkable way of telling a story that right. couldn't be told in okay. any other way. Okay. Um, it's, it's probably inevitable that that might happen, but I think these, I'm very suspicious of a technology leading creativity. It, it, that can happen. And like with computer generated animation is a good example. It was terrible for a long time because it was all about, this is a, this is a great technology. Well, yeah, it is, but that's not where the good stuff comes from. Mm. It's only when artists started to learn to use it that it became good. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I, um, it's interesting to see in, in my career, which has coincided with the rise of digital illustration too, that um, there's, there's been renewed interest always in traditional painting and drawing, which is which is where I sit. I don't really work digitally very much. So um, I feel that that's it's been around for quite a few thousands of years and I don't think that the magic of it is going to dissipate. Yeah. Yeah. Don't know about books though, you know, but um, if any, I would, I would survive doing something else if, if books, I'm not, I'm not terrified of that prospect. I think I could do, do other things. Well, Sean, I hope we do see many more of your books in the years to come and uh, they don't disappear too quickly. And look, I so appreciate you taking time and spending time to, uh, with me to talk about all these things. It's uh, been really great. So thank okay, you. Okay, great. That. Yeah, no, it's nice to have um, a chance to have an unhurried ramble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good questions too, not, not the, not the Thanks, most Thanks. obvious ones. Yeah. Thank you. magazine I just folded the drawing up <laughs> small as I could stuck it in an envelope just mailed it to them